Hey, what's up? As I've mentioned in my previous video, I've decided to switch the mapper for my NES game. So, let's talk about it. I started making my game with a basic cartridge setup that was used for the very first NES slash Famicom games. So that's 8 kilobytes for the graphics and up to 32 kilobytes for the code. Soon it became clear that I would not be able to make anything amazing with only 40 kilobytes, especially with the type of a game I was making. I'm not some kind of genius coder extraordinary that could squeeze a complex game in a, such a small ROM. So can we have something better than the basic 40 kilobytes? Yes, we can! Enter the world of mappers. A mapper is a set of hardware that maps the cartridge's memory into the CPU's and PPU's address spaces. So basically they can help your NES to access larger ROMs than 40 kilobytes. Also they can give some additional features to the games like additional sound channels, helping with number multiplication or making the four-way scrolling easy and so on. There are two types of mappers, the ASIC based and the discrete logic based. The ASIC based mappers use a very specific custom-made chips. A good example here is the Nintendo's MMC3, but I set a limit for myself to use simple and widely available components, so I could easily make my cottage at home. That leaves me with only one option, that is to use some kind of a discrete logic based mapper. These mappers can be created using just simple logic chips. I guess it's kind of similar to what I tried to achieve when I uh, did Atari 2600 cartridge upgrade to run ET. So I picked the UN ROM mapper. This one was kind of popular, especially there were a lot of bootleg UN ROM cartridges because they are pretty easy to make. The most notable games that used this mapper were such titles as DuckTales, Castlevania, Jackal and Contra. How can you go wrong with that? So how the UN ROM cartridge is different from a basic cartridge? Let's look at a couple of examples from the NES and Famicom. What's truly different is that with this construction, despite all the chips, the game itself is stored on a single ROM chip. This chip can store 128 kilobytes of data. That's quite a lot compared to only 40 kilobytes we had before. If I were completely barbaric, I could just rip off this chip and solder in my EEPROM and it would be enough to run my own game. So what all these other chips do? Ok, so you might think this is another ROM chip, but it's not. It's actually 8 kilobytes of static RAM. It stores the graphics like the CHR ROM in the basic cartridge model did, but now the game can decide when or what to upload to this chip. What makes it really cool that you can store compressed graphics on the ROM and uncompress when you upload to this RAM. This way you can store even more stuff. Also your game's code can generate some tiles and then transfer to this RAM. This defeats the original NES constraint that you can only draw predefined tiles from the ROM. Now that you can have RAM instead of CHR ROM, you can draw lines and all kinds of shapes. And that also means you can probably do 3D. A very good example of this is the game Elite. But don't misunderstand my words. Just because you can only draw lines and points doesn't mean making a 3D game will be easy. The main CPU is very slow and the data transfer to the static RAM is even slower. So you can't update huge amount of tiles very frequently. Ok, what do we have here? These two are 74 series logic chips. They are basically our mapper. They both control the three upper address lines of the ROM chip. 74161 is a 4-bit counter. In our case it doesn't count anything. It's used as a simple 3-bit memory cell and the 7432 is just a bunch of logical OR elements in a single chip. 
Let's talk more about the RAM. It's not like the whole 128 kilobytes are available at once. The space is divided into banks of 16 kilobytes. So we have 8 banks in total. Simultaneously you can access only 2. So that's a so-called ROM window. We have basically the same 32 kilobyte address space as we had in basic cartridge. The last 16 kilobytes or the bank 7 is always available thanks to the wiring of the 7432 chip. This bank should contain your game's main logic like your engine and some important constants. The second bank could be used for example for your level and it could be swapped with other 6 banks. So what needs to be done to switch to this mapper from a basic cartridge model? First you need to rearrange your code into separate 16 kilobyte blocks. Also you need to have 8 kilobytes free in your PRG ROM to store all the CHR data. That's basically what I had with my game, like if you remember I had 11 kilobytes free. After this rearrangement you will have to change your ROM's header in the memory configuration file if you are using the CC65 assembler. Mine looks like this. Basically you need to specify that you are using the CHR RAM and not ROM and specify all seven banks and their address spaces. Notice that all banks except the last one has the same address space. It is necessary to put seven bytes at the beginning of bank seven with values from zero to six. If you look at the bank switching code you will notice something interesting. So it tries to load a bank number from that data array we put at the beginning. But what's this? It tries to save the value back. But how can you save it to the ROM? ROM's supposed to be read-only, right? This write actually triggers the 74161 chip, which stores this number you've tried to write to the ROM. Depending on what value you wrote, the 7432 will enable a particular address line on the ROM. So this way we can access all 128 kilobytes of it. The switching between banks is pretty quick. You can switch them in a single frame. I actually tried to put the Family Studios engine and the everything that's related to sounds and music to a separate bank and it actually worked. But be careful, the bank switching can get really messy really fast. For instance, let's say the bank 1 is active and we have a subroutine in it, which calls another subroutine. And this another subroutine switches to a different bank. So after this another subroutine finishes its execution, the stack points to a address of this previous subroutine. But now we are in another bank and this subroutine simply doesn't exist here. So what's gonna happen? Basically your game will get stuck. So you need to be careful with what you write. Even though this mapper is pretty cool and simple, it has one major disadvantage. You can't have another SRAM chip and a battery for your saves. The only saving option is a password system here. So let's see how currently I use the ROM banks for my game. The bank 7 stores the main logic, the scrolling and collision code and of course the NPC AI. I put all the maps to the bank 0 which I use the most. The bank 1 is used whenever you hit the start button and the main menu is activated. And in the bank 2 I store the game over and title screens. The rest 4 banks are unused so far but I will eventually put something into them. Maybe some new areas and new animals. So what else is up with my game? Now that I have a bit more room to add new features, I implemented the day-night cycle with color palettes. Basically I save all four background palettes to the RAM and from time to time I will subtract 16 from all the colors except the uh, outline color because I don't want my objects to turn completely black. It's too bad I don't have that many transition states, but it still gives you a better feel of day and night. I also did some animal spawn randomizations. The werewolves 
are now spawned only at night. Also from now on the meat must be cooked. You can still consume it raw but it doesn't add any food points. And you can cook it only in your house but by cooking you will drain the fuel points. So you need to stack up on those sticks. So far there was no way to restore your health points. So I made that the sleep would do that for you. But by sleeping you will lose all the fuel points. I still need to add some fade out, fade in animations there. Both cooking and sleeping are accessible from menu for now. So I had to make the menus a bit more complex than before. And I'm really not happy with this blinking and shaking that happens when I try to switch from one menu to another. I will need to put more work into it. Also I've decided to update the HUD so it will have a more polished look. By doing that I had to squeeze my maps a bit by removing two rows. I replaced the text with these icons. You will still find the text in the menu state. Talking about the text I redrew my font because the previous one was I think lifted from Zelda 2 or something. Now the font is ugly but it's truly mine. I also added this day night indicator. It's not the final version but I think I'm going to improve it in my future updates. I don't think I'm gonna try to generate any tiles on the fly for this game but it was interesting to try switching between different CHRs. I added a completely different CHR for the title screen in the bank too. I actually experienced very weird glitches when I tried to load the CHR data to the RAM in the main loop. So it is wise to do that only from the NMI. Thanks to that now I have this picture in my title screen. I'm not gonna leave it there for the final game. It was just a fun way to try out loading multiple CHRs. By the way this picture took basically the whole background tile section. It would be impossible to have art like that on a basic cartridge. So yeah, I think the switch was totally worth it. Although for now I can run my game on the real hardware only using the flash card. But I'm looking forward to build my own UN ROM cartridge from the scratch. So if you're curious how it will go and what further updates I will make to my game, then please subscribe the channel. As usual you can find my game and its code on my GitHub page. The links are in the description. So thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Bye!